welcome to the United Methodist Communications Digital Lounge. I'm Diane Dagnan, and my guest today is United Methodist News Service award-winning photojournalist Mike DeBose. In observance of World Photography Day, he'll be sharing some insights that will help take your photos from good to great. This essential communications ministry requires financial support. If you believe in our mission, we ask that you would consider a donation through our foundation at resourceumc.org slash giveumcom. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Tell me, how did your love of photography come about? My dad made his living as a metallurgist, but his heart belonged to photography. He built a darkroom in our home, and I grew up peeking over the edge of the darkroom sink. And anybody who's ever seen a print come to life in the developer tray knows that that is magical. What is your favorite kind of photography? What do you most like to shoot? And you know, for people just getting started, how, how would they discover their own passion? My favorite type of photography is documentary photojournalism. Real people doing real things in the real world. So for somebody to allow me to share their story, to trust me with their story, is a great honor. An example of that kind of trust is this picture from the United Methodist Health Clinic in Bukavu in the Congo. And there, if you'll notice, there are two people sharing the hospital bed. And they don't know each other. They're not related. Gael and Margalit are on that bed together because there wasn't another bed for them to have. So there are two patients and two doctors and one photographer in one crowded little room. And the amount of trust involved in allowing me to go in there. If you can imagine with today's HIPAA laws, trying to do that in a U.S. hospital setting, it would be another matter entirely. So the trust that they showed for me to carefully share their story uh, was an honor. When you're taking a photo like that, or any photo really, what, what's your goal? My goal is to establish an emotional connection with the viewer. It's always important for the viewer to feel what you feel. I like to quote the David Allen Coe song, The Ride. Can you make folks feel what you feel inside? So we have a few photos, I think, that, that show some emotional moments. Do you want to share those with us? Absolutely. So this is Reverend Kermit Roberson, and he is in the cemetery at his church in Louisiana after a hurricane. And the flooding associated with that caused the concrete burial vaults to come up out of the ground. And he is showing us the damage there and just is overcome. And I, I think it helps a viewer to think, well, what if that was my grandmother? What if that was her grave? Here's Joseph catching the last little dribble of water from the uh, well outside of United Methodist Church in Monrovia, Liberia. And you can see he's not wasting a drop. Marie Dean is recognized nationally for her palmetto frond weaving. And just look at her face. Wouldn't you love to sit and visit with her? You can't help but smile when you look at that photo. You really right? can't. And the pig, it, happy at least for now. He's at the Ganta Mission Station in Liberia. I think he wanted his photo taken. He's kind of posing for that photo. I think we were there at lunchtime, and that's what he was excited about. But I'll take the smile however it comes. Well, there are a lot of elements in photography to think about. There's the lighting, the composition, the subject, the camera, um, and sometimes some of those are better than others. But is there one that you really can't compensate for if it's not there? Certainly all of those elements go into making a good photograph. And some photographs rely more strongly on one element than another. But th the most important thing for me is the content. The content is king, and I like to uh, repeat a quote from National Geographic photographer Jim Richardson. If you want to be a better photographer, stand in front of more interesting stuff. It, it really is that simple, and I do think lighting is a second, close second. Uh, the word photography literally means writing with light. So I'll show you a few examples of... Um, well, I've seen your photography, and I know you've stood in front of a lot of interesting stuff. Well, I do, I do uh, get to stand in front of more than my share of interesting stuff, but there is interesting stuff all around us in our everyday lives, in our own churches. You just have to be open 
to uh, exploring a different way? How many times have you been in the boiler room at your church? How many times have you been back in the kitchen? What does it look like when the pastor's getting ready, putting their robes on? Mm -hmm. These are things where you just need to put yourself in the mix a little bit with an open mind and open eyes. So you've got some examples for us here to show us um, about these different elements. This is Moses and his uh, down in a well in Cote d'Ivoire. We were visiting, doing a story about access to water. And he said, well, um, the bucket has fallen off the rope. And I said, well, what do you do? How do you, uh, how do you retrieve that? He says, I have to climb down in the well to get it. So, so the lighting The could lighting have been was a perfect. In that. No, no, there was plenty of light. And I love the little reflection that you can see of the light on the water in the bottom. And he's got his eyes turned up toward the light, so that helps his face be lit. And uh, just, just being there when that happened mm -hmm. provided me an opportunity to show how fragile the system is to Your provide the water. Your vantage point is not necessarily that interesting. You can change it, though, sometimes getting a different angle oh on a photo. Oh, my goodness, yeah. You should always try to get up high, get down low. Don't make all the pictures that you make from your own eye level. It's, it's very important to put yourself, your camera, and therefore your viewers in a different perspective whenever you can. Walk around. Take a few pictures in one spot, but don't stop with that. Move around and try something else. Are you using mostly natural light in these photos? Do you have lights you're carrying that's with a you? Really, that's a really interesting question. So over the years, um, I used to have to supplement light with a flash because there wasn't enough light. There wasn't enough amount of light. Now I almost never have to do that with the new digital cameras. They're very sensitive to light. So the only time I would really need to do that is if there was really not enough light or if the quality or direction of it was poor. So if it's a funky discharge lamp of some kind, like a street lamp, maybe the color's not very clean, I might rely on a flash. A professional photographer needs to be able to make photographs under any conditions that you might expect to, to face, so I always bring a flash and I hope never to use it. Do we have a couple of others? So lighting, as you were talking about, is, is a critical skill, and the, the skill that you need to develop is learning to see light the way your camera sees light. Your eye is a remarkable instrument, and it can see a range of brightness that the camera can't record. So once you learn to look at light the way the camera does, it'll go a long way toward helping you. This picture was made literally with candlelight. Uh, that's my daughter, and that's our church, and that's l literally lit with the light of two candles. These folks are from the Hope for the Deaf School in Monrovia, Liberia, and the tilt of their faces toward the light from the open window really makes this picture what it is. Her name, by the way, is Success Gibson, which I really love, and the quote outside on the, painted on the wall of the school is, We are evidence of God's grace. This picture from the Malacón in Cuba um, is I love interesting. That photo. Thank you. It's a very interesting lighting condition. So, it's late in the afternoon. The Malacón is the seawall in Cuba, and as you can see, most of it is in shadow because of the buildings on the right-hand edge. But there was a little slit of light where the sun shone between two of the buildings, and I noticed it while we were walking, and you could see the cars pass through that little slit of light. So I said, we, we're going to have to stop here, just park ourselves for a minute, and I would watch for the cars to come and shoot when they passed right through the beam. And you can see the people's faces in the car are lit by that little slit of light. And it's just that kind of thing that you see every day walking around. You train yourself to look for interesting light. I need a little bit of patience too, right? You need some patience, and your traveling companion needs some patience. <laughs> This picture from, another picture from Cuba, this is in Santa Clara, Cuba, and the color, the riot of yellow and red and the shadows were just so interesting. So I've, I've got light and color and composition going in this, in this photograph, but I, I wanted to wait for something interesting to happen there. So uh, my reporter companion, Linda Bloom, uh, agreed to, that we could just wait here at this corner for a little while. And maybe two or three people passed, 
and this woman came in a red and white dress that perfectly matched the stripes on the awning and it was just a perfect example. I saw something that was really interesting and I, I knew that something good would come from a brief stop there and the whole process probably took five or ten minutes. She looks like she would planned to be in that photo. Uh, straight out of central casting. So what's been the biggest game changer since you've been doing professional photography? You were talking a little bit about how that had changed. Any photographer of my vintage would have to say that digital photography and the attendant explosion in cell phone photography has rocked our world. It makes everything more accessible. That's a good thing. Everybody has the means to share their own visual story with them in their pocket most of the time. That can also be a bad thing. We are bombarded by a stream of images all day long. So they're of varying quality, and I think there's a little weariness factor that sometimes comes along with that. We're all taking more photos for sure. I mean, you can, can uh, you know, delete all your photos, and before you know it, you have 800 more on your smartphone. Um, so we're all taking more pictures, but if you really want to take better pictures and you're just using a smartphone, how do you up your game a little bit? What, how, how to get started in making those pictures better? Well, the best way to start is to really master whatever phone or camera you're currently using. And you want to identify some places where you have a deficiency in your equipment before you, before you go to buy something. So read the manual watch an instructional video. What you don't want to do is be surprised by the result of your, of your photography. A good photographer really ought to know what the picture's gonna look like before they push the button. Then once you get to the point where you say, okay, I can't do the pictures I want of my children's soccer game, or I can't make the wide angle scenic vista views of the mountains that I want, or I want to make better close-ups of flowers. The step up to a digital SLR or one of the new mirrorless cameras with interchangeable lenses, there are some solutions that might help you. But always remember that good pictures come from your head and your heart, not from the camera store. What makes the difference between a, a really good photo and a great photo? You know, for me, an extraordinary photo captures a decisive moment, as the founder of photojournalism, Cartier-Bresson, would have said. It captures a decisive moment of action or interaction. I also think that an extraordinary photo ought to have everything in it that it needs and nothing that it doesn't. So tell me, what do you mean by that? What, what might it have in it that it doesn't need? It might have a distracting element in the background. It might have a pole growing out of somebody's head. It might um, have an extraneous person in the background. One thing you can do when you're making your own photographs is to look slowly at each of the corners of your picture and see if there's anything in there you don't want. And you can move with your feet, you can zoom the lens, you can change your height, your angle, but try to be discerning about what you're including and excluding from your photograph. If the background is distracting, you do your best to minimize it. If the background adds good context and information, then try to include it. But be conscious of what you're trying to include or exclude. I think you've got a couple of photos for us to take a look at here. I do, with the caveat that I'm not holding these up as extraordinary, but they, they do capture a decisive moment, and they are uh, interesting stuff, in my opinion, and they mostly have the things they need in there and not, not too much distraction. So this picture is from a feeding center in Guba, Ethiopia, during the famine in the 1980s. And I just love the uh, Madonna-like body language, the fact that they're sheltered by their mom inside this blanket. You can tell that they're, uh, they've got something to eat, they've got this big spoon, and then this feeding center was in a tent, and the tent had some holes in it. And so the woman has a sunspot in the middle of her forehead that feels holy to me. It was like perfectly placed just by accident for her to have that sunspot in the middle of her forehead. And it's just a little pinhole in the uh, 
roof of the tent would allow the sunlight to come through. Makes it stand out. Well, this picture, I think that um, it was uh, um, the, the color of the bags in the photo was really um, just made for a good photo, wasn't it? I love the yellow. Uh, this is something that we do a lot in the church where we try to help after a disaster. So this is after Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. And a lot of times people think, well, let's show the stuff we're going to give away. So they'll hold one of the bags or people will stop what they're doing and hold the supplies and it's, it's just so staid looking but it's, it's a lot of work to pack all those bags and move them around where they need to go. So that is Jack Amick, the adult in there. He's the head of our UMCOR disaster response and Saniel Duarte is the son of the uh, program manager in the Philippines and they had been participating in gathering these bags and sorting them out and they finally got them all done and they were tired and they just laid back and it was a moment it was a well, it was a decisive a, moment and yeah, a photo that tells that story I mean you can yeah. can tell that that from looking at it and this is really cool this is a United Methodist beekeeper in Tennessee and he was going to show me um, display the queen bee so he actually has the queen carefully in his fingers and he's holding it out for me to make a photograph and one of the worker bees came out of the hive and smelled the queen's pheromone and flew up close to just check on her and it was just a perfect moment for that to happen you brought some cameras with this these are some of your favorites i think right well, they are. I, I feel very fortunate to have learned my craft on a fully mechanical, fully manual camera. So this is, this is my dad's 4x5 crown graphic. That is a beauty. It's the press camera of choice from the 1950s. If you ever see uh, one of the pictures mm -hmm. where they got the little press card in their fedora, that's the camera they're using. Do you so still use that sometimes? I haven't used it in years. It's the one I learned on. It's very versatile. You can use it as a Looks like it might be kind of heavy. It is heavy. It's slow. So you get one picture on one sheet of film, turn the holder around, get another picture on that side. So it's, it's slow. It's deliberate. There's nothing, nothing uh, automatic about that. And then this is another workhorse of, of the past. This is a Leica rangefinder. It's a German camera. It's very small, reasonably lightweight, very unobtrusive, very quiet. And a lot of photojournalists like it because it doesn't scream big honking lens. And it's just a little bit easier to blend into a crowd with something like this. So I do love these two cameras. I don't get to shoot them much anymore. It is hard to argue with the throughput and ease of use and the quality of a modern digital camera, but I don't get emotionally attached to those. I, I have several, and I don't, they don't uh, touch my heart in the way that these do. Well, I asked you to, to bring um, your three favorite photos, and I know that must have been quite a task to, to go through all of your photos and try to pick three. But you did, and so let's take a look at those. It's almost like asking me to choose among my favorite children, but I, I, there are a, a few that are my sentimental favorites, um, children and photos. But Let's take a look. All right. So this is from a story in rural Malawi about the difficulty of living without easy access to clean water. Um, the women of the village start their journey to the water hole every day in darkness and they arrived at this muddy open well just as the sun was starting to brighten in the east. Uh, the walk was an amazing thing in the dark, the rustling of the corn, the, the feel of the mud beneath my boots. The women actually sing in unison to warn off animals or even human predators that a large group is coming. They kind of buck each other's spirits up. And it was just such an amazing experience that I, I made myself quit fooling around with f-stops and shutter speeds for a few places just to absorb that feeling, that sensation of the, of the wet grass and the corn and the, and the mud beneath my feet. That's a nice photo. This is a subsistence level farmer in the Great Rift Valley in Ethiopia and he's headed to his field with his plow over his shoulder to begin the work day. And I love this photo both for its sense of place and its timeless quality. It looks like it could have been made any time over the last several centuries. 
And I do love that it was made on black and white film. Do you like to see it in black and white? I do. I miss it. I miss black and white film. I miss the dark room. I can make black and whites out of color on the computer, just snap of a finger, but it's, somehow it's a little different. I think I see differently when I had black and white film in the camera. I know that the, how the tones are going to react to one another and, and the color is just so easy to look at the back of the screen and there's a little more interpretation involved in the black and white. I, I do miss it. I do. These babies are in the Methodist Hospital in Strumitsa, Macedonia. And uh, I was visiting the hospital as part of a group. And I made some excuses to lag behind the others on the tour. Most people who know me well know that I'm a little bit medically squeamish. And I had my fill of the uh, emergency room and the operating suites that they had shown us with people in there being treated. And uh, so I had kind of lagged behind. And somebody called from the front and asked me to come up. And I thought, oh, I don't know. I don't want to go back up there. And, and there were these beautiful babies sharing a crib. So those are, those are three of my favorite and most, uh, most meaningful photos. Well, Mike, these are really some really compelling photos. And I thank you for sharing them with us and giving us some of your experience and your wisdom to help us maybe take our own photos a little bit better. I'm going to start checking the corners of my photos the next time I take right. one. Thank you for having me. And we want to thank everyone for joining us for this World Photography Day edition of the United Methodist Communications Digital Lounge. Thank you.